It's only sport with Martin Devlin on the platform. Brought to you by One New Zealand. Let's get connected. 81 test veteran of the All Blacks. Justin Marshall joins us. Justin, I, I sigh when I ask you this question because I think it's the biggest load of nothing there is. But South African rugby have now formally apologised for disrupting the haka at Alice Park. You were there. What did you see? Well, look, first of all, they, they just got their timings off big time. Look, they, they want to put on a show, and, and Alice Park is special, to be honest, Marty. And being there and being part of it um, and the atmosphere and the environment and, look, ultimately the supporters, they, they are at the next level, honestly, when they walk into that stadium. And to have the All Blacks there, they, they just consider the All Blacks as their greatest rival. And... I think it's a, it just generates this atmosphere like you never experience in the game really anywhere. Uh, and they, they they then want to make it a massive fanfare. And by doing that, uh, they want to add these components that they feel will, will add to the environment and add to the atmosphere. But ultimately, um, they just tried too hard at the weekend. Um, you know, the fact that they had uh, the DJ playing um, when, when the haka was going and then the playing and the timing of that was, wasn't great either. And and everything. Um, ultimately, I think they recognise that what they were trying to do was disrespectful for what the All Blacks uh, know historically is something that they traditionally do, and um, they got it wrong, basically. So, look, I, mate, at the end of the day, good on them. They've come out, they've apologised, they got it wrong. Did it affect the game? Did it affect the quality of what we saw over 80 minutes? Absolutely not. Um, it, it, all it did was just have an impact on the build-up, and look, at the end of the day, as long as the game's not affected... Uh, and they get it right and they recognise that they got something wrong, let's just move on. Yeah, are you offended? I'm not offended. I'm just wondering who the hell no. is offended. Look, the, I, I um, remember doing the haka uh, when um, the Aussies were singing Waltz and Matilda. Um, I remember doing the haka at Athletic Park where the Australians went down to the 22 and um, they did a, a warm-up drill and they didn't even face us. Um, you know, 46 points to six later. They probably regretted doing that, but um, ultimately, at the end of the day, like you do, you go out there. It's part of your pre-game routine, the haka, the national anthems. That's all about the build in to, to build into the game, and then you start the game. Um, so no, I, I wasn't offended. I, I, I when it happened, and I was sitting there at the stadium, I thought this is inappropriate and shouldn't be happening. But I still saw the All Blacks unaffected by it. So you know they still go about their method and their process and, and get on with the game. Um, it's just a shame that uh, that the I guess the sort of all that paraphernalia that goes on around the the game um, has an effect when it shouldn't do because I can tell you now and and I've been here for just over a week, Marty. The South Africans love all black rugby and equally they're fascinated and intrigued by the haka and a lot of people wanted to see that haka and wanted the crowd to be quiet and they wanted every, the stadium to be quiet so they could see what it's all about. A lot of them would have been there for the first time in their lives and never experienced it before and it was ruined by just that pre-game bullshit so look hopefully they got it out of their system and we don't see it at the weekend and i'm sure that they would have rectified that hard uh, to when you're flying a jumbo jet i reckon to get the timing exactly right (laughs) isn't it i mean you can't really bank you know take five turn around come back again and wait i mean it's, it's impossible so yeah, all right. I mean, yeah. I, I just think it's a bigger, much to do about I'll nothing. tell you, the plane thing, mate, sorry to, to interrupt you. The plane thing, like, the, the best thing for me was the time before this when I was there at that stadium, uh, nobody told me that the plane was coming. And I had my back turned and we were live on TV. So it came, the, the plane came over earlier. And obviously, like, the, this for this one, if you don't know, they actually de, they obviously de-throttled um, the plane, for want of a better word. I don't know how to fly one, so that's the terminology I'm Go going on. to use. So it wasn't as loud, but the time before that when it came over, this thing was fear hiking, and I had my back turned to it, and I was making a comment on the microphone, and I can tell you now, it's probably the closest I've ever come to possibly yeah. after the effect yeah. getting the sack, yeah. because wow. the word F nearly came out of my mouth because it was such a roar and then there was this big shadow behind me and this plane noise and I was like I didn't I didn't know that this plane was doing a passover and I literally absolutely cracked myself and nearly said the f word on TV so this time I was pre-warned I knew it was coming um, and and obviously it's a lot easier when you do know what to expect so hey look at the end of the day it's 
pretty spectacular. You wouldn't be able to do it anywhere else in the world, I would suggest. Justin Marshall with us. You've had a couple of days. I love talking to you, you know, a day or two after the event, so we've all had time to breathe and get over the emotion of it and everything else. Uh, first and foremost, I thought we were, you know, we were really good for 60, 62 minutes there. We had a four tries to one lead. So, you know, you've got to put a big tick beside that. You know better than everyone that Test Rugby is about 80 minutes and they ran us down again in that last 20 minutes. So it was almost like, to me, two completely different games. There was the first game where we were in charge, we felt like we were in control, and then it all unravelled for us. Is that how you saw it? It did. And I, and to a degree, um, you know, obviously, the, South Africa are the only team in the world that can do what they do with their bomb squad. But that bomb squad came on. There was five of them that came on in the 48th minute. We didn't make our first substitute to around the 60th minute. And they weren't five. It wasn't five players. It was one, I think, at that time. And then we just filtered our substitutes through, whereas they replaced five in one big hit. Um, so you know the bomb squad's coming. The, the, the difference with the reserves that the South Africans are putting on to the rest of the world at the moment is you're putting on test caps with the most unbelievable amount of test experience that then enter into the game after work that even equally as experienced players have already done. So they're in this unique position where the players that are going on probably could even start for the Springboks, but yet they're coming off the bench. But when they come on, they're not overawed by the situation. They're not um, in awe of the fact that they've got to come on and try and grab the game by the scruff of the neck to try and wrestle it back like they did at the weekend or equally continue the momentum. And to, and to me, that that's, that's the point of difference that they have um, over most teams in the world. I'll take that back, over every team in the world at the moment. But the All Blacks would have known that that was coming. I think probably the thing that I'm kind of thinking about at the moment, Marty, when I when I, I digested the test match, probably a couple, you know, a day later and two days later, and now talking to you, is like what what the Springboks are doing to us is what the the world renowned, renowned um, All Black teams of the past used to do to teams exactly right that were yeah that's what we used to do, mate. Like, we, we exactly could have right. a pretty average day, but we would run them down in the That's last right. 10 minutes, yep. five minutes, and somehow we would find a way to win. At the moment, like at the Argentinian game in Wellington, like at the weekend, you know, we're 10 points up with 12 minutes to go. Those games, we would never let we would never let them go. And and this is the probably concerning thing, that at the moment, our DNA used to be that we had that experience. We had that X Factor off the bench, or we had that resolve of a a 15 that just knew how to get the job done, had been to World Cups before, had been in big environments, were unfazed by them and unflappable when the, when the pressure really came on. These are the test matches at the moment that we're dropping. And, and look, all black teams around that World Cup period at 2011 to 2015, in that situation at the weekend, probably wouldn't have dropped that test match. But whereas South Africa at the moment are very good at winning those test matches, um, they, they have reached that level where they can get the job done. And that's the only area we need to grow in because, mate, I cannot fault the way that we executed our game plan, the width that we showed in our game, the way that the blitz defence didn't phase us, the way that Damien McKenzie finally took some depth, timed his, his entrances into the game, gave other players space, the forward pack fronted, we were physical, we score, outscored them on the, on the tries. <sighs> Golly, you know, like... I kind of sat there after the game. I was trying to put into perspective exactly how I was feeling. I was feeling flat because we'd lost, but I was also feeling encouraged that we can actually take these guys on and we can actually get to where you and I have been asking the All Blacks to get, which is back to best in the world mm -hmm. because they are the best in the world. And to a degree, for 68 minutes of that game, we were better than them. Yeah, this is a frustration, all right. Um, and, you know, we've seen it three tests this year now where we failed to score in the last 20 minutes. And we always look for patterns, don't we? We look for recurring patterns and go, okay, wh what is going on? Why is that repeating? And for three tests out of six for that to happen, uh, you know, you talk about experience. Look, something like 13 of these players were involved in the 2019 Rugby World Cup that, were, <laughs> that are in this squad at the moment. Uh, there's 14 or 15 of them that were there in 2022. So it's not like we lack experience I look at our bench, no. though, mate, and I just want to know, tactically, what are we doing? Why aren't, you know, are our substitutions coming at the right time? Are the right players coming on at the right time? What is the thought process in actually substituting these players? Because it just appears a bit higgledy-piggledy to me. Possibly. Yeah, I'm really glad you make that point and ask that question because 
I, I did actually say that um, leading into the game, and, and obviously being here and being involved um, with, with Super Sport and, and, and kind of not part of the New Zealand media um, set up to a degree, probably those comments might not have been heard. But I did ask the question on a couple of shows I was involved with during the week and, and equally in the pregame when I said, and, and, I, and I questioned it, and, and, I, and I've always said to Razor, you know, mate, when, when I do put these things out there and do be critical to a degree, mate, pick up the phone and let's chat about it. Um, you know, I've got to be that way. I've, I'm your mate, but equally I've got to see it for what it is. And I, I, I was very surprised when the Springboks named their side, which they always do early in the week, that we didn't respond with maybe a 6-2 split on the bench. Like the, the, the side that we named with putting Cortez Ratama there and then equally Anton Leonard Brown. Anton Leonard Brown can play from 12 right across the rugby field. Bowden Barrett can play 10. Rico Iwani can slip onto the wing. Geordie Barrett can go to fullback. We have players with the ability to play multiple positions. So why don't we put a Dalton Papali'i and, and go for a 6-2 split or or put a Josh Lord, whoever it might be, why don't we just match them? You know, you got your bomb squad right, eh? Well, we're going to be tough as well in, the, in that last 20 minutes. And I, I did question whether or not we didn't respond because we've got the flexibility and because we've got players that are extremely adaptable and can play multiple positions across that back line that if we did lose um, a back or two, that we could actually compensate, it from, uh, compensate for it, but yet take that just a, a little extra bit of physicality that they're going to bring to us in that last quarter of the match and, and think about that constructively. So, I don't, look, whether they got that right or wrong and whether they're even thinking about this, this uh, that this weekend, I'm not sure. Look, we, mate, we got ambushed at Twickenham um, pre-Rugby World Cup, didn't we, where they put eight forwards on the bench. And our response was to stick with the normal 5-3 split. So, you know, are, are, we, are we stuck in our ways and are we actually like Rassi? Because he can be a little bit peculiar, <laughs> let's face it. Mm-hmm. But are we actually thinking outside of the box like he is and going, you know what, we're, I'm actually doing this for a reason. And if you don't respond, you might find yourself being bitten in the last 10 minutes of the test match. But if you do respond and do something that we're not expecting, well, that might throw what I'm doing off a little bit. So, yeah, it's just something to throw out there and for people to talk about. It's only sport with Martin Devlin on the platform. Brought to you by One New Zealand. Let's get connected.